When we read the Bible, it has a purpose, that God calls the world into order or into being, and then calls us into the order of the church. There is the world in all infinite creation, and then our place within it as disciples of Jesus. Genesis, the beginning, the first book in the canon, the promise, Materials from ancient times are integrated into our theological understandings. We have much to learn from these texts, and the subject matter is of great import to our lives. In the scripture matter presented this morning, we heard that people are the glory of creation, and yet are a control problem. Whose world are we living in? We live in God's world, not a world of our own making. We are to live with other creatures, some of which are dangerous, but no matter, we are to live with them as they are part of our ecosystem. At the Natural History Museum, there are pop-ups within this institution. At one door, going into an exhibit, there was a man holding a pelt. He asked people to feel it. It was soft and smooth and just lovely. It turned out to be the fur of a coyote. He stated that if one lives in the city of Los Angeles, within a small circumference of where you live, in essence, your neighborhood or a large kind of a neighborhood, there are 150 to 300 coyotes living in your midst. As sure as can be, I hear stories and I see coyotes as you do. Okay, who's seen coyotes in the last year? Oh, look at this, everyone. Look at all of us. Ron was minding his own business, walking to class at the Los Angeles Valley College, and there, right on the sidewalk, was a coyote with a sandwich in his mouth. <laughs> My son Nick and I were walking down Magnolia, west from Coldwater, at 6 p.m. on Christmas Eve. We were waiting for takeout and decided to stretch our legs. Behind us, Nick noticed a large animal walking down the sidewalks, following us about 15 feet behind. Again, a coyote. We call him our Christmas coyote. Both locations are close to the Little Tohunga Wash. It is common knowledge in the neighborhood of Valley Glen that there are many coyotes living in LA Valley College who come, romp, play, scrounge, and pounce on our very streets. We, as stated in Genesis, are to live with God's other creatures. This includes trees. Trees so important to our current survival are critical in this narrative. Prior to the introduction of our tree in Genesis 2.16, there was time spent on the tree of life. This tree represents anything that celebrates life and adds to the greater good that is an enhancer, not a detractor. The tree of life centers on right relationship with our ever-creating one. Yet, as the tree of life is depicted, so too is the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Well, that sounds pretty helpful. We love and hold a high value to education and knowledge. A colleague, a social worker of mine, stated once that our education, our knowledge, is something that can't be taken away. Our marriage can dissolve, one can lose custody of children, houses can burn down as in Paradise, California, cliffs can erode, dragging our houses down into the sea. But her master's degree in social work can never be disputed. This is the tree that is forbidden by the Lord God. God in this passage gives us three points, vocation, permission, and prohibition. The vocation is to till and keep, to work and take care of what is before us. That is our vocation. That is the part of the terms of call. We are given permission to do the work so that we take care of creation. Not only we, but all who live on the earth can be sustained. The serpent enters the narration. We learn that the woman heard quite clearly what was expected. Then we find that the woman wants to learn in this fashion and leads in sharing this exciting experience with her husband. God is not in the discourse, absent as creation squeaks, groans, and learns in positive and negative ways. 
Did you know that we are having a new hanging which is being created by all of us and designed by Judy? She has already created one, uh, Be Still and Know That I Am God, and we place it behind the choir. This one as well will be another one. She is asking all who care to join to trace their hands on a piece of cotton batik fabric, which will be adhered to a gorgeous piece of blue woven upholstery material in the background. She first began with the participants at the women's retreat. Next came the hands of those who stayed for fellowship hour. Continuing on, Judy will be tracing hands uh, from KCVC, our Jewish community, and Messy Church hands at our Purim party on March 6th. Then the fusing and sewing will begin in earnest. As we look at hands, we can think of washing them often and thoroughly. As the first couple of Genesis changes, they learn to sew, which we can appreciate. However, they change in other ways. Instead of tilling and keeping, they are hiding and thinking only of themselves. Perhaps that is a good thing, being naive is calming, but protecting that large organ of skin could be helpful, as it is possible a, there is a world of hurts and cuts out there. Walter Brueggemann wrote about this passage, that in our interpretation of it, we focus on the prohibition, not on the positive aspects of all that has been granted to us through the grace of God. The story of Jesus in the wilderness begins right after he has been baptized by John. Right after, God shines down and glorifies the beloved, straight from the love and water into the torment and drought. The Spirit guides us as Jesus was guided even in difficult times. The writer of this passage has Jesus deciding on his own to fast and uses the important 40 days and 40 nights symbolically. Then, not surprisingly, he was famished. Next comes the scene wherein Jesus is tested to see if he is obedient to God. Jesus represents the kingdom which is being threatened by another cunning creature. The tempter is on him when he is in a weakened state. Each throws barbs of scripture at the other, with Jesus only using his own words near the end of the story when he tells the tempter to get away. Never does he change his position. Jesus does not use violence, nor did he use miracles to get out of this predicament. This is Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, starting out feeling life at a very low point, but continuing on. When Kirk Douglas died last week at some point, his son Michael told a story of his father's temptations. He had the nicotine habit. He was a smoker. How he quit smoking was quite exceptional. He decided to carry a cigarette in his pocket day in and day out. Every time he wanted to smoke, he would ask, and say to himself, who is stronger, cigarette, you or me? Well, Kirk Douglas was very strong and a tough man, and he never smoked again. We could all think what tempts us and place it in our pocket as it calls out to us to break down and give in. Jesus did not give in. He persevered, knew what to say, handled every situation which came his way, and then once he found John the Baptist was arrested, he picked up the pace and started his prophetic ministry. We are beginning Women's History Month this very day. We are ordering some books for our 75th anniversary table about strong women, one who grew up in this church. Anne decided, and I completely agreed, to only use hymns where women wrote the lyrics or the compositions or both. As I went through the hymnal, I noticed that there were many hymns written by Dr. Mary Louise Bringle. The hymn that I chose for today that she wrote was uh, Calm to the Waves, the one that we sang uh, twice uh, through the, for the uh, assurance of pardon. Dr. Bringle is a professor of religious studies at Brevard College in Brevard, North Carolina. She teaches philosophy, religion, and French. 
She was born in 1953 and in 2000 began writing hymns. She stated that the reason that she began to write hymns is due to one of her students. He wrote her after he graduated and stated, I'm getting married. He wanted a specific gift. He asked her to create the text for a new hymn and then he would set it to music. Then everyone would sing it uh, during their uh, marriage ceremony. When this happened and the wedding service was in play, she heard her words, his composition, and the entire congregation singing, and she stated she was hooked. It is interesting to note that one of her projects, which impacts us every week, is that she chaired the Presbyterian Committee on Congregational Song, which culminated with the hymnal we use, Glory to God. She has written a book about the process regarding how many decisions there were to be made, not only on which of the 853 hymns were included, but also about the accompaniment, information for each specific hymn, and how best to prepare the print and the page for easy reading. So now, if you would, I would like you to pick up one of our Glory to God purple hymnals. And open the first page and look on the left side. And there's a dedication. Uh, my question to you is this. How many of your hymnals are dedicated to a woman named Lene Body? If you look around, you see that many are. Okay. How did this come to be? Her husband, Dick Body, not a member of our congregation, loved his wife, Lene. Lene was smart, organized, funny woman. She worked in our church office for a period of time along with my husband. They had such a good time working together. They had a great time. They would laugh and they told me some of the things that they were doing and they just had a good, really a fun time together. After she died, Dick was called to see if he wanted to dedicate a hymnal to Lene. He asked, how many do you need? And I told him, well, about 130 or so. And he said, fine, I'll buy them all. And I go, we don't need you to buy them all. We have other people who would like to dedicate some hymnals. But he did uh, probably do 127 of them. So when you look at them and open them, and he wanted everyone dedicated to his dear wife. Uh, another story from our 75 years of living together. We share in God's work. We open our fellowship hall so that 543 people could vote yesterday. We remain a voting center until the last person votes uh, about 7 p.m. on Tuesday night. We have vocation, permission, and prohibition. Jesus had to be within these guidelines as well, so knows of our life and knows of our struggles. Sustainability is at the heart of the issue of survival. What can we do without and continue to thrive? What property do we have that we don't need? What space is underused? How are we tempted in a manner which is not sustainable for our environment to continue? How are we tempted to veer away from white relationships? Share your ideas with each other on how to save on utilities, reduce use of plastics, and grow trees and vines. Tell others of how you can deal with problems in a proactive way. Speak up about staying healthy at this time of infectious disease. Hold something in your pocket which reminds you of your vulnerability and work to strengthen yourself in all you do. We can recall negative aspects of life like our understanding of the story of Eve character having the audacity to take a bite of fruit. We can focus on prohibitions rather than permission. We can focus on temptations rather than on the terms of call. Jesus struggled through the tough times, and so do we. Yet the angels were there to heal Jesus following the tempter's leave. We can have angels here on earth who will support us, care for us, Position us in a way to help with vocation and fun. 
Work on having those people around you and make sure that they are numerous enough that it is a rich layer of tapestry. When you see the finished hanging up on our walls behind the choir, you will see many, many hands, all eager to help and create and think of our future together. We can be grateful for all moments in life when we have the chance to live and glorify God. Amen.